Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mary Eberstadt. Mary Eberstadt is a senior research fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, D.C., and author of several books, including How the West Really Lost God and Adam and Eve After the Film. Her forthcoming book, Primal Screens, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics, will be published in August of this year. In 2014, Seton Hall University awarded Mrs. Everstadt an honorary doctorate in humane letters, who featured her as their commencement speaker. Her essays and reviews have appeared in many magazines and journals, including Time, The Wall Street Journal, National Review, First Things, and the Catholic In fall 2017, her 2010 novel, The Loser Letters, a comic tale of life, death, and atheism, was adapted for stage, and it premiered here on campus at the Hartford Theater. She has a lovely new website, which you might want to check out, simply maryeverstatt.com. And uh, finally, I would add that Mary was especially good friends with Michael and his dear wife, Karen, too. So for that reason as well, I'm so glad that she's here with us today. Welcome, Mary Everstadt.
for whom his towering work, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, would serve as a providential blueprint during the years in which those governments clawed up from decades of communist oppression. In surveying just some of Michael's work in preparation for today, I was struck all over again by its magnificent scope, its piercing illumination of one subject after another. Peering again into this legacy can't help but make anyone feel inadequate to the task of addressing it. But the only consolation in this regard is that I couldn't think of any living soul equal to the task. But at the same time, the opportunity to reflect on some of his books has meant consolation of another sort. It's brought back again the avuncular genius known to some of us not only as an intellectual colossus, but also as a mentor and dear friend of the quarter century. For over 25 years, along with my husband and Michael's wife, Karen, we saw one another regularly. This was especially so during the summers because of the coincidence that our families serendipitously chose to spend time in the same seaside town. The many hours spent with the Novak family and its revolving cast of characters are among the happiest that many of us have ever had with friends. So just as reading Michael's work conjures these memories and more, today I'd like to try and put him back in this room a bit for people who do not share that personal bond. And I'd like to do it by focusing on an aspect of Michael that deserves more attention in the public eye especially today. That is Michael Novak, Catholic, and the influence of Catholicism on his life's work. Now, of course, he was always identified as a Catholic intellectual. But in a secularizing age, it bears special emphasis that Michael's Catholicism was the irreducible nucleus that held together every orbit in which his life's work was spinning and spin still. Today, I would like to give five examples as evidence for that proposition. Michael, of course, was an intuitive Trinitarian. He had a great fondness for arguments made in sets of three. But I'd like to think he would approve my giving five examples instead of three. Five is more than three, after all. An amplifying discussion of his work was not something Michael was known to discourage. <laughs> so let us consider five ways in which Michael Novak, Catholic, accounts for Michael Novak, public intellectual. The first and most obvious way in which Catholicism dictated Michael's intellectual legacy was his lifelong preoccupation with a question central to the Gospels, how to help the poor. It is precisely this concern that lies at the heart of the spirit of democratic capitalism. Because its author remained focused on what would benefit the least among us, he could see what others could not, namely where material progress really comes from. The inventors and discoverers in many fields of business, he said, were not the secular demons of all progressive insistence. They were rather human beings who were benefactors of the human race. Here's another quote. Better eye care, dental services, hygienic products, vaccinations, and miracle cures were saving lives in almost every family known to me about his childhood. Quote, older people who a generation earlier would have been dead were still living, and in many ways living better, thanks to these material improvements. For this pragmatism, Michael Novak has been excoriated by critics who spied in this rehumanizing of capitalists something sinister a sacralization of democratic capitalism, as one particularly emotional critic put the charge. But I would argue that such arrows have always missed the moral mark. 
I will leave it to the speakers who follow to take up the subject of capitalism versus socialism in more detail. But I would like to make three points in passing about Michael's defense of economic liberty. First is a moral point. Critics on the left, yesterday as today, suffer a moral blind spot. They fail to understand that arguments on behalf of capitalism might be driven by something other than sinister motives. Theirs is a lapse of charity. This is the deeper meaning, for example, of today's socialist call that, quote, every billionaire represents a policy failure. <coughs> no, he or she does not. He or she is a human being made in the image of God like everyone else. Today's progressivism, like yesterday's socialism, runs a real risk of dehumanizing opponents and reducing them to their bank accounts. And if the strongest among us can be dehumanized in such a way, what should we expect for the weakest? Michael Novak never shared in that kind of error, and not for nefarious reasons. He could see with the eyes of the poor themselves what capitalism had given the world. He also knew, unlike some of his opponents, that an epithet was not an argument. A second point about capitalism. Michael's robust defense of economic freedom was never about some Ayn Randian straw superman. He believed, and he argued over and over, that economic liberty was the setting most conducive to human beings thriving in community, specifically the community of the family. One rarely has heard from his critics yesterday or today about chapter eight of the spirit of democratic capitalism. It is all about the repudiation of the notion that capitalism is for isolated individuals. In that chapter, he criticizes the libertarian assumption present in most textbooks on economics to this day that the individual stands at the center of economic activity and that capitalism is designed to serve that individual. He made this point instead, quote, insofar as democratic capitalism depends for its economic vitality on deferred gratification, savings, and long-term investment, no motive for such behavior is the equivalent of regard for the future welfare of one's own progeny, unquote. This situates the family at the very center of capitalism. In all of this, he was correct, as we see today. Consider the phenomenon of the, quote, marriage divide, documented by W. Bradford Wilcox, Charles Murray, and others. The marriage divide means that people located at the top of the socioeconomic ladder are considerably more likely to be married and stay married than people at the bottom. This includes a great many people who live right but talk left. That is, it includes social liberals who are liberals for everyone else but domestic traditionalists for their own families. Living in the community of the family helps to conserve wealth. Living as an atomized individual helps to scatter it. The great crack up of our time, the anxiety that pervades our politics and society today, can be read as an indictment of many things. Failed policies, human frailty, the sexual revolution above all. But capitalism, per se, is not one of those things. <coughs> A third point about capitalism. Like other neoconservatives who have become maligned for their similar defenses, Michael's understanding of capitalism appealed as its final witnesses to the poor. As he put it in his address on winning the Templeton Prize, quote, for all its deficiencies, even its gaping inadequacies, Capitalism is better for the poor than either of its two great rivals, 
socialism and the traditional third world economy. Just watch in which direction the poor of the world invariably migrate. The poor of whom my family and living memory was one know better than the intellectuals." Unquote. That is not a sacralization of economics. It is American pragmatism making a moral point. So a second way in which Catholicism reveals itself as the center of his thought can be seen in Michael's preoccupation with caritas. There was no dearer subject to Michael Novak than love. And his understanding of love was not the schmaltz of Jonathan Livingston Seagull. It was undiluted Thomism. In a fest shrift compiled for Michael's 80th birthday by Professor Elizabeth Shaw called An American and Catholic Life, his longtime colleague and collaborator wrote a beautiful essay about what she called the golden thread of Michael Novak's work. That is the notion of caritas, which Elizabeth Shaw defines as, quote, the self-generating, self-sustaining, and self-diffusing love of the Trinity, unquote. As such a description makes clear, this is an intensely Catholic understanding. It would be impossible to understand Michael's work without understanding something of the essence of caritas, as her essay indicates. So I would like to touch briefly on two examples of what this means. On the theoretical plane, Michael had much to say about caritopolis, or the civilization of love, the civilization optimal for human flourishing. What does it look like? It is centered on a Thomistic understanding of love, love that wills the good of the other. Throughout his writings on Caritopolis, Michael takes pains to distinguish that city from one that is ideal and unattainable. To think in a utopian way is a sin against Caritopolis, as he put it in one of his last books, Social Justice Isn't What You Think It Is. I emphasize this point because I think people often mistake what Michael was up to in talking about this. His was not a platonic understanding of what an ideal city might look like. It was rather a deeply Catholic understanding of the intrinsically relational and sacrificial nature of love. This same Thomistic understanding is one that Michael lived out in real life. A few years ago, when he was thinking of publishing some of the love letters that he and Karen had written to each other before marriage, he asked me to read through them with an eye toward writing an introduction. I mention this because in these letters, on the part of both writers, what leaps out is an extraordinarily mature desire for the well-being of the other. It's apparent from early on. The letters cover a period of months beginning with their meeting on a blind date on March 22nd, 1962. During that time, Michael and Karen were mostly separated and reporting to each other with vivid local color from Iowa and Cambridge, Massachusetts, Paris and Rome, and other points in between, as they were moving around in ways that um, students in the room will find particularly recognizable. So one of our protagonists is Karen Lau, who is later to become Karen Lau Novak. She is a 24-year-old artist of serious soul, a former student of Oskar Krakatsche in Austria, who is already making her own artistic mark on the world as these letters begin. She is the more taciturn of the two correspondents. She struggles with wanting love on the one hand, but not wanting it to overshadow her work on the other. <coughs> She is a shy beauty from Folsom, Iowa, who is nonetheless drawn artistically to dark and difficult aesthetic matter. Michael decides upon meeting her that he wants to marry her. And from that moment, the chase is on. Her favorite book is St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul. So is his. What are the odds of that? <laughs> 
Our other protagonist in the love letters is a young novelist, student, and scholar who is already publishing and traveling widely. From the very beginning of their time together, these two people share something that many couples will never know, which is mutual dedication to each other's work and well-being. Thus, in one of his earliest letters, Michael urges Karen to try for a Guggenheim or some other prize, like the Prix de Rome. A letter or two later, he is urging her to mount an informal showing of her artistic work. He adds that he is looking forward to seeing the first formal showing. He learns about art for her sake, as these letters reflect, and he coaches her and fills her in about writing. Later on, when she does win a painting prize, he urges that you've got to learn how much pleasure your work will bring to people and how deep your talent runs. How much pleasure your work will bring to people is another example of caritas in action. Karen, for her part, repays the interest. She consoles him over her early disappointment in his novel sales, and she otherwise encourages him to keep her involved in his writing. Just a few months into their correspondence, she says, it would be such fun if you would write a few short things, poetry or stories, and I could illustrate, set the type, and print it. That is an impulse to collaboration that foreshadows what will be their greatest joint work of all, the 46 years spent together following their marriage. More caritas. Throughout life, Michael showed the same Thomistic impulse, not only in willing, willing the best for his friends, as many in this room will know by personal experience, he also worked overtime to make it happen. Here's one example among many. In 2010, Michael arranged an event where he gave the floor to a discussion of uh, my first work of fiction, The Loser Butters. It's a very unlikely tale about a young woman in rehab who is wrestling with questions of theism and atheism. Upon hearing our, our daughter Catherine, who's an actress, read a few lines from the book aloud, Michael announced this should be a stage play. And he kept insisting on it. Six years later, and thanks in part to Michael, that prediction became reality. The play premiered at Catholic University's Hartke Theater in fall 2016 for two weeks. How Michael relished his role as impresario in this shared adventure, and how he shone at one of his last gala nights out ever, as we celebrated with family and friends the play's appearance. How I wish he could know now that there are two new adaptations underway, one in the United States and one in Malta. None of it would have happened without Michael Novak's Caritas. So a third way in which Michael's legacy remains unthinkable apart from his Catholicism concerns a philosophical point. That is his lifelong grappling with the profound question of what is knowable and what is not. A good thinker will understand that there are things we cannot know. But only a great thinker can discern where the lines are because only a great thinker pushes logic all the way to the boundaries. And so, paradoxically, only those who know most are capable of understanding just what they cannot know. Michael Novak was that thinker. Consider his 2008 book, No One Sees God, The Dark Night of Atheists and Believers. This was published at the height of the new atheism and as a response to it. In it, Michael makes a characteristically bold move. Instead of excoriating them, he invites the proponents of the new atheism to join him in meditating on the fact that doubt is intrinsic to the human condition. <coughs> he invites them to consider that we are all a community of doubters and that there is a purpose to this doubt. <laughs> Children, he points out, love in order to be loved in return. But mature love is something else. Doubt teaches us to love for the sake of love, Michael writes. 
atheists and religious believers are not as estranged as they assume. The point, he said, is less to believe in God than to know him. And the only way to know him is by a brave, blind leap into what is not only unknown, but unknowable. I know it's a lot to take in after breakfast. <laughs> also characteristic, the author makes this rich argument with a dazzling display of erudition worn lightly. From the story of Elijah in the cave, on through the writings of a prodigious list of thinkers, old and new, especially the great Christian mystics to whom he returned as Karen perpetually returned to them in her art. The point is that no one sees God is an inescapably Catholic response to the new atheism. It is evangelical in its approach to opponents, Chestertonian in its grasp and depiction of paradox, and suffused with a universality grounded in a Catholic understanding of what is common to all humans as humans, whether they are inside the church or out. In the present moment, we hear a lot of talk about civility and a lot of hand-wringing about divisiveness in America. There is no better way to overcome division than to engage one's opponents with respect and use reason to establish common ground. Michael repeatedly used reason as an end run around acrimony. This too is a lesson drawn explicitly from the Catholic tradition, according to which logic correctly applied reveals truth. Fourth, Catholicism was essential to Michael in one of his other incarnations as a Saloniste par excellence, a long-standing social impresario and mentor on a bounteous scale. One of his favorite quotations, as he mentioned often in conversation, was James Joyce's description of Catholicism, quote, here comes everybody, unquote. I don't know how accurate a summary that may be about the Catholic Church in this present anxious moment. But I do know that here comes everybody was a superb way of describing the Novak dinner table. Michael and Karen Salon in Washington, D.C. was a powerhouse of colleagues from the American Enterprise Institute and related communities, plus any number of other names, household and otherwise, along with interns and other people's children and sometimes people who were working in the house. Then there were <coughs> the seaside dinners at their home in Delaware, which doubled as Karen's art studio and was a summer retreat for visiting students from Ave Maria University. On any given night, the cast of characters in the Novak summer home might include, in addition to Michael, rotating family members like Sister Marianne and Brother Ben and daughter Yana, rotating students who added an antic energy to the cooking and cleaning and after dinner ruminations, as well as providing free entertainment in the form of uh, music, and sometimes poetry, uh, rotating Everstats and their friends and their children and sometimes their children's friends, rotating other friends and of course Ben's magnificent dog, Powell. <coughs> Many of those fortunate enough to have been in on the fun will remember those evenings for conversations cerebral, like ongoing discussions of Catholic, capital S, social doctrine. But less noticed, and maybe even more important in the long run, was this lesson, the reigning law of Novakian Catholic small s social doctrine. That is, according to this law, everyone will be included, no matter how big or how small. Inclusion went beyond these light summer evenings. Michael's attentiveness to the souls around him shaped the future lives and careers of a great many people, whether in this room or not. This was especially true of young people. He'd have been thrilled by this event today, but nothing would have meant more to him than to see the students of Professor Widmer and others in this room. One of the last things he ever wrote, by way of example, in fact, to our knowledge, the last thing, 
was a letter of recommendation to Columbia University, specifically to its graduate program in acting, on behalf of a former Ave Maria student named Peter Atkinson. Columbia's drama program is famously competitive. But between Michael's sweet talk and Peter's talent, Peter was accepted into Columbia right after Michael died. He has gone on to excel at serious theatrical work, even while still a student. How it would have thrilled Michael to see that this winter, Peter starred in a production of Eugene O'Neill's Ah! Wilderness at the Sheen Center in New York. His performance earned accolades from all over, including a half-page photo that accompanied the review in the Wall Street Journal. My point is that this was the kind of mentorship that Michael Novak lived for, helping faithful people into artistic and professional life, including into circles dominated by secular postmodern ideology. This was also the kind of outcome that he had in mind in devising his last creation, the American Academy for Catholic Thinkers and Artists, about which I'll say more in a moment. <coughs> Fifth and finally, another measure excuse me, of Michael's ineradicable universalism can be found in the figurative homes that he built over the years or helped to build for other thinkers. He could not stop creating communities for ideas with outstanding and ongoing results. First Things Magazine, which he helped to found, really is the most influential journal of religion and ideas in the English-speaking world. The Terzio Millennio some, uh, Seminar in Krakow, Poland, now led by George Weigel, really has resulted in a community of ardent, educated Catholic leaders from Central Europe and the United States. There are now many hundreds of alumni in that network. <clears throat> the same is true of the Slovak Summer Seminar on the Free Society, led by Robert Boyle and also founded by Michael Novak. What most people do not know about is Michael's last effort at institution building. It absorbed much of his time and attention during the last two years, and a widening circle of friends tried to help with it. This was his blueprint for an explicitly Catholic society of elite thinkers and artists modeled on the Academy Francaise. In the course of several meetings in Delaware over two summers, several of us discussed the need for an association of artists and writers to serve as a counterforce against relentless secularist progressivism in the arts and in the academy. So we tried to hammer out ways to build that thing. We studied the examples of the Inklings at Cambridge, including by reading Carol and Philip Zaleski's history, The Fellowship, about the fellowship of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and so many other fellow travelers who were a minority in their time. The summer before Michael died, those years of talk and that vision produced an early fruit. The American Academy for Catholic Thinkers and Artists met in miniature in Delaware for three days. Those present included, in addition to Michael, Hadley Arts, <coughs> Igor Babailov, <coughs> Patrick Cassidy, Father Thomas Joseph White, and myself, as well as Aurora and Paul Griffin and Robert Warren. <coughs> Among Michael's other actions, he saw to it that ACTA had bylaws and other legal frameworks to take the association into the future. He also spoke of his hope that the group would be used for different forms of mentorship, bringing junior members into the ranks, including some students, to benefit from more senior ones and to ensure continuity. This association is a potential powerhouse suspended in the making with scores of top American thinkers and artists on the initial roster devised by Michael. It could be a significant moral weight in the public square in many ways, via public letters on critical issues of the day, mentorship, or raising awareness in a secularizing country that there is such a thing as a Christian perspective. 
It needs the usual, infrastructure and administration. One of Michael's last questions to me was whether I would see to it that ACTA would live on. I am trying. It is to be hoped that anyone interested in helping to build Michael Novak's last institutional creation will be in touch. That fledgling creation reveals all over again the theme before us. Michael's last serious effort, like all the serious efforts of his life, was Catholic to the core. <clears throat> One quotation that often makes the rounds today is from Pope Paul VI, who observed that, quote, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses, unquote. Well, Michael Novak was indeed a teacher to students and statesmen, colleagues and critics, and past, present, and future generations of readers around the world. But he was also, in ways easy to overlook, a Catholic witness to the faith. His fearlessness about speaking of all things Catholic made him an example to all of us, and an example to those today who wonder whether they would have the courage to speak their minds. Follow him. Michael Novak's first published book was a novel called The Tiger with Silver, about a seminarian studying in Rome. Its subtitle is A Novel of Spiritual Adventure. A life of spiritual adventure may not be the first description of Michael Novak that comes to mind for many, but it was his spiritual adventure, his love for the church and the faith, that made possible his dazzling intellectual and other legacies. He was not only a friend and mentor to many around the world, he was also and irreducibly a Catholic mentor who showed by his example how to demand excellence, how to think and act with charity and universality, and how to show no fear. He was indeed a Catholic for all seasons, sorely missed, but a consolation always just the same. Thank you very much.